This is our newest version of Let's Talk okay. Conversations with Advanced Practice Nurses. And, and we have as our guest, Jonathan Nelson. Jonathan is with Hackers, is it Unlimited? Hackers, Hackers and Founders. Founders, yep. Hackers and Founders. And he is also an advisor to the SEC on capital formation. He has been involved in more than 40 companies over the past three years. Hackers and Founders is the largest group of tech founders globally with 200,000 members in 118 cities and in 44 countries. He founded Hackers and Founders as a way to build his business network. I find Jonathan very interesting because he's a, an old school ER nurse and manager. And I wanted him to talk a little about the transition between being an ER nurse and going into um, high tech. So I've asked him to join me here today yes, and I thank you for doing so. So hi, Jonathan. <laughs> how are you? Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. Doing well, ma'am, yourself? Your father sounds like my father. You <laughs> had to have a trade before you left home. Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to know, how did he get you to go into nursing? Was it him more or you more? What was the motivator? So my mom was a nurse. Um, my, I grew up, my mom and dad were missionaries in Central America for 20 years. Um, so I grew up as the only white child at the end of six hours of dirt road in a poor little town in rural Honduras called Minas de Oro. Um, and mom is, did a lot of backdoor nursing or what she called kitchen door nursing. Um, mom and dad ran a school um, for 600 people. And then um, she ended up treating, you know, malaria, you know, cuts, bruises, broken bones, that sort of stuff. And the, uh, my initial thought for my career was I wanted to be a missionary like my parents. Um, and dad wanted a, uh, us to have a trade. And I said, oh, great. You know, um, I've been programming since I was seven, um, helping run your guys' uh, mailing list. I should be a programmer. And dad said, mm, you know, I don't really want you playing video games, son. Um, I I'd love for you to have a job helping other people. Um, so why don't you become a nurse? And I thought about it. And they, uh, at the time I was working at Walgreens and they, uh, working my way through seminary. Um, and I said, you know what, let me take a break from the seminary thing and let me get a job so I don't have to work at Walgreens anymore. And they, um, so I went, took a break from that, went to nursing school. Um, and then after nursing school, I went, went right back to seminary and they, uh, within six or 12 months, um, I dropped out and just, um, the, to be a man of the cloth was not to be my lot in life. And I started <laughs> working as a PR nurse, um, in inner city Chicago for a good six or seven years. Okay. Then, and as you were working as a nurse in Chicago, then did, did you move to California or were you, what, what oh. happened? So as a nurse, um, I ended up doing a lot of agency work um, and okay. contract work and um, travel nursing. So I ended up working in about 35 hospitals over 20 years. Oh, me? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I just bounced around a lot and I found that I could, um, well, the thing was for me is I, I, nursing was something that I was passionate about, about doing a great job. Um, it wasn't necessarily like my lifelong passion to become a nurse. And uh, I was frustrated because there were a lot of other things, a lot of other entrepreneurial activities that I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to figure out how to sell something other than hours of my life to a hospital. Okay. And so I just decided I was going to try to figure out how money worked. And I found myself working as a hospital in Chicago. Um, and then I said, well, I'm going to sell hours of my life to a hospital. Let me try to sell my hours for the most money I can. And so I started doing contract work, temp work, agency work, um, travel nursing. And so we worked in Chicago. I worked in Chicago. Um, my wife and I moved to outside of Boston for a number of years. Um, we landed right before 9-11. Um, 
And so um, I went back to school when we were outside of Boston um, for, I was trying to figure out what else to do with my life. Um, I thought maybe um, animation and visual effects. My wife wanted to go to film school. Um, okay. So I studied that, um, finished most of a degree, and then we moved to Los Angeles. Um, tried LA for a couple of years, worked as an ER nurse in Los Angeles. My wife tried to get a, a toehold in the film industry. And a, uh, I was wanting to be a visual effects artist, but a friend of mine that I met out in Los Angeles said, you know, if you really want to be creative, in this business, um, you should be a programmer and build the tools that the, the artists use. And I was like, you know what? I wanted to be a programmer when I was a kid. Let me go back to school for software engineering. So I studied nights and weekends at the University of Maryland, um, finished up most of an engineering degree. And then I, I learned that in Silicon Valley, you could sell little packages of ones and zeros <laughs> and that sounded to me like a great idea because I can copy and paste ones and zeros. Um, mm -hmm. And so we moved to Silicon Valley so I could learn how to be a tech entrepreneur. And at one point I, I managed 700 people. I was a hospital supervisor at one of the hospitals in Silicon Valley for uh, about a year. And then four nights a week I would program and, and try to get a company off the ground. And then one night a month I started this meetup group called Hackers and Founders to get to know other entrepreneurs um, interested in building tech companies. Um, and, and that's what I want you to talk about now is hackers and founders. So yeah. exactly. You have, you, you just meet up and the first night, how many did you have there? Uh, it was five people and me in a bar in, in Sunnyvale, California. And uh, it was really my wife's loving insistence for me to get out of the house because I was driving her crazy talking about entrepreneurship all the time and technology stuff all the time. And she's like, honey, you're working nights, you're working weekends, and you're the only person you're talking to about me is me about all this stuff. You need to go out and build your own network and build mm -hmm. a business network. So please, for the love of God, get out of the house one night a month. Um, so I did. And I started this meetup in a bar and this meetup just kept on growing and growing and growing um and in 2008 2009 the last economic downturn um we started having hundreds of people from around the world start to show up at these bars and say hey jonathan what is silicon valley i have had this business idea i have this project that i built i want to actually um, raise some venture capital for this idea. Do you know anybody I should talk to? And I was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not really connected to the investor community. I'm a nurse. They're like, what? Why are you at Hackers and Founders? I'm like, oh, I went back to school for software engineering and, you know, I'm building, you know, four nights a week when I'm not at work, I'm, I'm building my own startups. They're like, that's weird. Well, yeah, you know, here, let's have a beer and a talk. And I started trying to help people and trying to get them connected to the right places. And uh, six years ago, um, our community was having, we'd had events in about 60 or 70 cities around the world. And we had about 100,000 people who had attended our events. <laughs> and I was like, this is crazy. There is this massive push towards entrepreneurship worldwide, but who's helping these people, who's nurturing these communities, who's helping provide education, who's helping provide mentoring, and who's investing in these companies around the world. Um, so six years ago, I literally burned my nursing license and I said, I just need to try to make a go of it. Um, so I did, and the business we started was helping companies move to relocate and move to Silicon Valley and helping them raise capital, helping them do legal restructuring, build business networks. Um, they would pay us in stock. Um, we figured out a way to bundle that stock together into a type of fund and then mm -hmm. sell off part of the fund to raise capital. Um, I believe I'm now the founder of one of the largest networking organizations for tech entrepreneurs globally. Um, we've actually had events in 195 cities now. We've been growing a lot since that initial, that, that initial stuff that we, the initial copy that you had. We've had over 350,000 entrepreneurs attend our event. Um, and I got really, really frustrated at how 
hard it was for an entrepreneur to raise capital unless they were in Silicon Valley. Um, and as a nurse, I tend to walk towards problems and try to fix them. Of course, that's a nurse, um, very much a nurse move. Mm -hmm. And so um, we got involved in a little bit of policy and politics work um, when a number of my friends were getting deported during the Obama administration, I had friends who had raised a couple million dollars and they got deported um, because of immigration reasons. Mm -hmm. um, during the time, USCIS, the Immigration Division, was very worried about potential fraud for terrorist attacks to come in. And so these entrepreneurs were getting deported as potentially fraudulent because they didn't really have a quote unquote business. They didn't have a physical address. They just had a website. That's not really a company, is it? Um, and so we started working with the Obama administration on immigration reform, on how do we actually let entrepreneurs into the country. Um, and the Obama administration let us know about the JOBS Act, which is called crowdfunding. And yeah. the idea that entrepreneurs and nurses would be able to fund each other's companies would be really appealing to me. And so I said, how can I help? And he said, you know, the SEC is going to need some comments uh, on how these laws that we're passing should actually work. And you have this massive network of grassroots entrepreneurs. You should submit some comments. So we did. Um, we were quoted about 50 times in the SEC regulations. And um, I was asked to become an advisor to the SEC for a couple of years on capital formation. Um, That's great. Mm -hmm. So it's a yeah. weird pathway, but a lot of it came from just that nurse's training of how do I help you? What hurts? How can I help? And then trying to find solutions for those pains that entrepreneurs have. Well, what type of business endeavors are you helping now? Because I know that your organization tends to help with the infrastructure and the development of other different innovative ideas. And so I wanted just a little sampling, a smattering of, of what you, you're working on now. Yes, ma'am. So we, um, a lot of the companies that we work with have an invention, a technical invention at the heart of them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the companies that we actually work with is building an um, automated toothbrush. So it's like a car wash for your mouth that actually has... <laughs> six motorized toothbrush heads. So you put it in your mouth and in 15 seconds, um, okay. it washes one side of your mouth. You flip it around 15 seconds. It washes <laughs> all the teeth on the other side. Uh, okay. So they're going to be launching, I believe, a Kickstarter here pretty quick. It's called Talo Brush, T-A-L-O. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of software companies just because we're in Silicon Valley. Um, we have... One company, uh, a lot of companies building apps. Um, we typically don't do the engineering services that a company actually needs because, you know, they need to be able to kind of get that invention off the ground on their own. We spend a lot of time working on the business model. How do we actually help them grow sales? How do we help them raise capital? Um, there's one company, um, for instance, that in Mexico out of our portfolio there, they have actually developed a way to, um, they're looking for alternative sources of protein instead of just using beef or chicken, okay. mm -hmm. which is very CO2 and climate unfriendly. So they're actually using cricket protein. Oh, that's interesting. Cause that's a high protein uh, insect. Yes, ma'am. And it's very, very CO2 efficient. And so, um, it's, they have actually developed technology to farm crickets in Mexico where they're based. The Native American tribes will actually eat crickets. And a lot of times if you're feeling adventurous, you can get crickets with your tequila um, mm -hmm. in Mexico, but they've actually developed a flour that they're using to make cookies, which are now sold in GNC in Mexico. Um, okay. And they're starting to develop chips and a number of different product lines using insect proteins. Okay. Uh, well, are you able to get funding? Um, um, are, you, are you for these different companies? Or do you fund them yourself? 
so we're transitioning. In the mm -hmm. past, we have primarily helped them get funding. Um, I have been very, very frustrated with um, Silicon Valley's approach to how it funds companies. For instance, less than 4% of venture funded companies in Silicon Valley have a woman founder. Mm -hmm. Less than 1% have an African-American founder. Less than 1% have a Hispanic founder. Um, what being in healthcare for 20 years was that if you wanted to build a data-driven selection process or a data-driven solution, um, you need to remove the sources of bias. So when we actually select companies, um, we have an online application that removes names, ages, genders, schools, and the emphasis is really on the company that's building built, that being built and how the company has been doing. Um, as a result, 60% of our portfolio companies have a woman, Hispanic or African-American founder. Okay, that's wonderful. So Silicon Valley kind of has a bit of a, a, unintended, but it's an institutional racism and sexism bias. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to tweak that and change that. Um, but it's become clear to me that we just need to build our own fund. Um, and I mm -hmm. wanted to build a fund that nurses could invest in to be able to invest, you know, my dream. Exactly. Is yeah. Have a fund that nurses could invest 20 bucks a month into a portfolio of, you know, a couple hundred technology companies. Mm -hmm. So that's required a bit of innovation on our part. Um, and we're actually going to... Uh, take our venture funds to IPO to public so that people will be able to buy the stock on a stock market. Um, and then money that we raise in that IPO in the stock market will actually be used to invest in tech companies. And that's really the only legal way that nurses would be able to actually invest into groups of other entrepreneurs. In a, on oh, that's great. Now, how many nurses are, are members of Hackers? Honestly? Um, yeah. I, not that many. Oh, we need to get some more nurses in there. I know. I know so that's, we do. That's my call for it, <laughs> for my audience. Is that, Thank you, ma'am. Yes, yes. All these nurse innovators, come and join Jonathan, who understands you initially. So That's it. Yeah, come join us. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I see you have been a community advisor at the Innovation Law Institute at the University of California Hastings. Yep, Tell me a little about that. Well, um, again, it goes back to that nurse's training. If you see a problem, um, you know, you yeah. say, how can I help? And so I was introduced uh, to the UC Hastings. So honestly, they, they were the ones that actually helped us um, and helped me kind of get up to speed on the legal issues on okay. equity crowdfunding and the JOBS Act. Mm -hmm. And so they were our partners in submitting the 80 pages of comments to the SEC. Um, and then they started a program to provide free legal advice to entrepreneurs. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. And I said, this is amazing. How can I help you? They're like, do you know any entrepreneurs that would need some free legal advice? <laughs> set up a free legal clinic. I'm like, yeah, how many hundred do you want? And they're like, well, we need a couple dozen. And I was like, mm, okay. Um, and so I've been an advisor to that program for a number of years, but the idea is how do we actually decrease the cost of setting up a company for an entrepreneur? And so we're working on that. And part of what we've actually learned has been through being an advisor to this legal clinic at the, um, you know, at this law school and legal clinics are, you know, kind of like, you know, free healthcare clinics that are, you know, medical yeah. university would actually run. I love the idea because it just kind of matched my nurse's background. Exactly. Um, and so we've been involved with them for, for a number of years now. Oh, that's great. Now tell me now with your venture capital fund, initially you used blockchain and did digital share certificates. Are you talking about transitioning that into an IPO? Yes, ma'am. So the, the problem is, is that we have a bunch of entrepreneurs around the globe. When I was at the SEC, um, one of the SEC commissioners asked me to do a study of why does so much money get invested into Silicon Valley tech companies? Mm -hmm. And why so little money get invested into like entrepreneurs in Atlanta or DC 
or mm -hmm. Chicago or Des Moines. And so I spent a lot of time doing that study and the answer goes back to this weird way of how we invest in tech companies and how the investors make money. So an investor makes money when they invest into a company only if that company gets sold to somebody else in a merger exactly. acquisition mm -hmm. or if that company IPOs. And then that way that investor can sell their shares to other people. And so if, and if you're in a country, like if you're in Latin America or if you're in Lagos, Nigeria, or if you're in, you know, Czechoslovakia or even Norway, it's really hard for you to convince companies that you're going to be able to, or convince an investor that mm -hmm. if they buy your stock as a small business, that you're, they're going to be able to resell that stock at a, down the road. You know, how do you convince an, an investor that you're going to be able to sell your company to Google exactly. in Atlanta? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was working on, and the idea of a blockchain stock certificate was one that was going to be, hey, what if people could actually raise money online in crowdfunding and then resell their stock, um, not necessarily on a stock exchange, but on the internet, on like yeah. the blockchain and the crypto exchange. Exactly. Um, there is a legal and regulated pathway to do that. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince investors that I was going to follow the laws to do that. You essentially have to do the legal requirements for an IPO to be able to buy, sell, and trade stock. And so we just decided to IPO the stock of our fund first. Mm -hmm. And then after that, put that stock certificate on the blockchain so that people can buy and sell it on the internet and have that stock represent a share that's traded on uh, the stock exchange. So, so long term, that's still our process, but we have to IPO this thing first. So you're going to IPO the stock first. Yes, ma'am. Then you're going to do a blockchain uh, share certificate. Blockchain stock certificate. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that is very interesting because then we are going in, like you said, into the crypto cryptocurrency approach to providing money. But well, well, really, the transfer of money is, is interesting with, with cryptocurrency. Yeah, and it's part of the problem is as well is that there's been a lot of problems with scammers using this technology. And so people didn't really believe that we would follow the rules. Uh, mm -hmm. And so instead of that, we're using the same underlying blockchain technology. Um, we're IPOing first. And then after that, instead of calling it a cryptocurrency, we'll just call it a smart stock certificate. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's a smart stock that people would be able to trade from their cell phones. Um, yeah, and it lasts into perpetuity. Yes, ma'am. So and it doesn't get altered. It's probably going to have to take. It's probably going to take us another couple of years to actually get there, but that's the roadmap. And with all this going on with the coronavirus, yes. I am sure that you are thinking about ways to address it using technology. And I'd like to just hear some of your thoughts along those lines. <laughs> so I, I just got asked to join an advisory board of a, a group of Harvard, um, a group of Harvard critical care physicians are creating an innovation challenge to build ventilators, uh, to be able to innovate ventilators and to be able to massively create ventilators. Mm -hmm. um, for use not just in the United States, but also in poorer countries. Okay. Uh, so literally the call before this was them asking me to become join an advisory board. I did a lot of ER and ICU. And so mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been a ventilator jockey for a number of years. Um, mm -hmm. And one of my big worries has been, you know, how many times did I work in inner city hospitals where we were completely overwhelmed because the lack of ICU beds, which was meant a lack of ventilators. And we have patients sitting in the hallway waiting for beds. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I just know, especially with what's coming out of Italy, that this is going to be a massive, massive problem. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of research on what are ways that we could actually build new ventilators um, that low cost, like a ventilator shouldn't have to cost $25,000. Yeah. Um, you know, what is India going to do when they need ventilators? Like you can't have a $25,000 ventilator in India um, mm -hmm. or Mexico or Brazil or Colombia or, you know, Nigeria. And so how do we get the cost of building a ventilator down? Are there ways that we can manufacture a couple million ventilators in a very short amount of time? Um, and so those are those are challenges that we're going to be working on over the next six to 12 months. Okay, that, that is great. That is great. Well, Jonathan, is there anything that you would like to share with the nursing community that I might have missed in our discussion? You know what? It was one of the, there's a couple of very difficult challenges that I had as a nurse working on becoming mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. Um, one was just overcoming people's biases. Okay. You know, um, I, my first meeting with a number of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, I made the mistake of wearing scrubs because I just worked the night shift and I was having a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought Silicon Valley is very meritocratic. It won't be a big deal. Um, but there is very much a bias. People did not understand that nurses are creative. <laughs> that what we do, <laughs> that what we do all the time is problem solve. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, people have a misconception of, of nurses um, as, you know, kind of being little worker bees, which we are, but we're very creative, very hardworking worker bees, and we will find a solution for whatever problem that we actually have, and we can be incredibly resourceful. Um, overcoming people's biases was actually a big frustration of mine. Um, two is... I was actually really terrified to make mistakes as an entrepreneur and as a software engineer when I actually first started making that transition. Um, you know, as an ER nurse, the doctor says, hey, go ahead and give, you know, five milligrams of, you know, medication A to the patient. Um, if I don't know how to, what the, that medication does, I stop, I ask someone, I look it up in a book, I look up, you know, side effects, contraindications, why are we giving this, this and that, and the other thing. And then I'm, after I'm absolutely sure that it will do no harm, then I will go ahead and give the medication um, or do a treatment that the physician asks. As an entrepreneur, there were things that I, I didn't know how to do. Or as an inventor, there was things like I was building software and the process of building a software product is you don't know how to build what you're building. And so I stopped when I'd come up to those problems and I said, where's the textbook for me to be able to build this thing? Like, where is, you know, where are the studies, the academic research that tells me what's the best thing to do as an entrepreneur? And there really isn't any. A lot of it's just you figure it out. Exactly. And you, you invent it, you come up with a solution. And I, I actually had these little mini panic attacks saying, I don't know how to build this software. What am I going to do? If I build the software, someone's going to die and they make a mistake. There's a bug. Someone's going to die. No, <laughs> no they're not. that's not how it works. Yeah. Uh, the part of the process of being an entrepreneur is you try something, you fail, you try something, you fail, you try something, you fail, you try something, you fail. Um, and it was very challenging for me to get into kind of that type of workflow and that type of cycle. Um, another thing that really struck me was, and I just said it, I said the word fail. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of emotions attached to that word. Of course, especially with nurses, because when failure, you have adverse outcomes. Absolutely. Like yeah. people die, they end up maimed. Yeah, exactly. Like, 
you have to call a code when you fail. Like, no. Um, and so how I actually usually like to discuss it is I like to say, I'm going to have a business hypothesis. I'm going to test my business hypothesis. I'm going to collect data. And then based on that data, I will either confirm or reject my business hypothesis based on that data. So my very first business hypothesis was I was working at a hospital and I saw nurses sharing cat pictures all the time and to, on the email in 2006. <laughs> So my business hypothesis was that the world needed a website to share the world's best cat pictures. <laughs> it worked for you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I got really sick of looking at cat pictures after nine months and I decided that was not a good project for me. <laughs> and I spent six months building a website to share the world's best cat pictures. And I was like, well, then what? Um, I built it, but now who's going to come and use it? I had to then convince and cajole people to use my website. Um, and so was that a failure? No, I would argue at the time I felt like it was. Um, but now I would actually consider that I had a business hypothesis that if I built a website um, for cat pictures, that people from all over the world would come and share the best cat pictures on my website. Um, the data that I received was that that was not accurate. Yeah. And a, another thing that I received, another bit of data that I was not expecting that I received that I collected, another assessment that I collected was that I didn't really like cat pictures that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, my next business hypothesis was that, well, I love this idea of these websites where you can share news and that sort of stuff. This was early days of Facebook and it still hadn't taken off a lot. And I said, well, who else is really addicted to like sharing stuff and talking about stuff on the internet, um, news specifically. So I built a website to be able to share business and financial news. Um, that was my hypothesis. I built it. Um, I did not validate that hypothesis, um, but I learned a lot of additional interesting data. Mm -hmm. uh, people were looking for business news and financial news outside of the United States. And I got that from some of the data tools that I had built. And then my next hypothesis was maybe I should build a search engine for business and financial news coming out of you, not the United States. And that idea went a lot better for me. Um, and I got a lot of good data that validated that hypothesis. And then I said I was going to start raising money, but I'm not going to go and directly ask investors for money for this business project that I have. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them, what do I do with this community of hackers mm -hmm. and founders that I built? And what do I do with all of these business problems that all of these entrepreneurs are coming to me with? And ultimately, I found that these entrepreneurs had a lot of hair on fire problems that needed to be solved, i.e., how do I raise money? And a big part of that initially was for us to help them move to Silicon Valley to raise money. Exactly. Now we're building a tool so that we can invest anywhere in the world um, through our fund. Um, Google doesn't have to acquire you. And we can actually invest in a lot more different types of companies. And so the, the big learning for me through all of that was talk to your customers or potential customers first, learn what are huge hair on fire issues for them, and then build them the product. Okay. Don't do what I did and imagine customers for five years while building projects for imaginary customers. That, that kicked my butt. I would like to know when you go public with the stock. Yes, ma'am. I, yeah. I will do that. <laughs> right now, the stock market's a little topsy-turvy, so it's probably at least nine months from now. Okay, but you're going to let us know because we're going to have all the nurses lined up to buy this stock. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am, I will. All right. Well, thank you so very much for your time. 
Um, this is uh, another episode of Let's Talk Conversations with and for and about advanced practice nursing. Uh, you can find us on YouTube at Let's Talk Nursing, Blog Talk Radio, Conversations about Advanced Practice Nursing, Facebook, and Apple Podcasts, Let's Talk Conversations about Nursing. This month, we are focusing on nurses and technology. So you will see this along with Dr. Bonnie Clipper talking about innovation in nursing. And uh, again, I thank you for joining us, Jonathan. It's been great. And uh, I look to speaking to you in the future. My pleasure, Ms. Carson Smith. And thank you very much for doing this. This is a great resource for nurses. Oh, thank you. Take care and have a great day. Thank you, ma'am. You too. Okay, bye-bye.